Good morning. So I want to talk this morning about uh, building an effective life. Something I'm sure we'd all say we want, building an effective life. Let me read something from the first chapter of Peter's second letter. Try and listen to these words carefully. Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But before we do that, when we were singing Reckless Love, it reminded me about the G7, which I think their final meeting is this morning. And I was thinking, actually, what a, an important meeting is going on there down in St. Ives. But the irony is there's a more important meeting going on here because we're meeting with God, aren't we? But wouldn't it be great if those important people, those world leaders, this morning, on a Sunday morning as they met, if God could somehow break into their meeting. So should we just pray for that meeting right now? Father, we understand the way the world is governed and the way things work and the way you bring important people together. And Father, we know that we've got those world leaders down in our, the southwest of our country enjoying the beautiful weather there today. Father, as they meet together for their final session on your day, Father, we pray somehow that you would be on the agenda. Father, we pray that you break into the hearts and minds of those people so that as they make their decisions, they would have godly answers to the problems that they discuss. But also, Lord, just as you've spoken into individual lives today, Father, we pray that you'd speak into their individual lives too. Amen. Second Peter is my favourite book of the Bible. What I love about it is it's written by somebody who had a fantastically transformed life. We can read in the Gospels, can't we, about the life of Peter, who was leaving a mundane life like you and I as a fisherman, yet when Jesus intervened into his life, he was transformed. And we know from church history that Peter became one of the foundation stones, one of the builders of the early church. Peter says here in the letter that he's a servant of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you know that um, that word that we read many times in the New Testament, servant, is actually a mistranslation. That Going back to when the Bible was first translated into English, people were offended at the real meaning of the word. So they said, 
that person was a servant. Peter wasn't a servant of Jesus Christ. He said he was a slave. The word is doulos. It means somebody who's given up their life to somebody else. Peter wasn't like somebody out of Downton Abbey that one day a week could have a day off and go and do something else. He knew that he was a slave to Jesus, that he was owned by him. He'd gone from being a fisherman to somebody whose life was given up to Jesus Christ. You know, this letter was written from prison. Remember, we've spoken before about the fact that Nero, you remember the, uh, the Roman emperor Nero? He tried to burn down the city of Rome to allow him to rebuild it. When people found out that he'd done that, he looked for a scapegoat and he found the Christians as the scapegoat that he could blame. Peter, as the leader, was arrested and put into prison. And I just want to remind you that when Peter was in prison, it wasn't like the prisons that we have today. I've never been, fortunately, to prison. But from what we know about them, they're not too uncomfortable these days, are they? That wasn't the same for Peter. He was in prison. And we know that what he was doing was contemplating. He was thinking about how Jesus had changed his life. And in this letter, he's conveying to a group of Christians he loved what he felt were some of the most important aspects of the Christian life. And if you go on to read in the book, you'll read about the warnings that he gave to the church against false, false teachers. But right at the start of the book, he's passing on his life wisdom. He knew that he was going to die. You know that we know from church history that Peter was crucified upside down, actually crucified at the same time as his wife. He knew his death was coming. But as he was in his prison cell, he was moved by God to write to the church in Turkey to talk to them about what was important. And the Holy Spirit inspired him to write down here the things that he was contemplating in his cell. And right at the start, he tells us about the things that we need to do to build an effective Christian life. Now, you might be here this morning thinking that you don't have what it takes to build an effective Christian life because you're not somebody like Dan. You don't have the charisma, the learning, the understanding that Dan has. But Peter makes it very clear that you and I have everything that we need to build an effective Christian life. He tells us that we've got salvation, that we've been saved from death to life. He makes it clear that we are now sons and daughters of the living God because we've accepted Jesus as our saviour. He makes it clear in what he's saying that he knows that we've got forgiveness for our sins and we've got the Holy Spirit, God himself, living inside us. But for here and now, God has given us everything we need for godly lives because, Peter says, he's given us his very great and precious promises. So if you're a Christian this morning, Peter makes it clear that we, you and I, are the recipients of God's very great and precious promises. So if you're a Christian, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you have the promise of eternal life. You have the promise this morning of comfort and help from the Lord Jesus in your daily life. You have the promise 
of the Holy Spirit living inside you. And Peter says, because of those things, because of those very great and precious promises, we can participate in the divine nature. Peter wasn't saying to Christians that we are gods. What he's saying is we are united with Jesus. When Peter spoke to us a few weeks ago about the fruit of the Spirit, he reminded us about the vine and the branches. Through those promises, you and I are connected to Jesus this morning. So when we've spoken about the G7, those leaders, those people that run countries, that run great economies, they're not like you and I. I don't know about their personal circumstances, but I suspect that none of them would claim that they know Jesus as their Saviour and Lord. And because of that, they aren't partakers in the divine nature like you and I are. So what an amazing meeting this is today. Christians who are participating in the divine nature. Now Peter says, for that very reason, because of that, because of those things, build yourself an effective life. Build an effective life. He says to the Christians that he's writing to, which is you and I, he says, make every effort. Dan, that's a prompt in a moment. Make every effort, not just yet though. <laughs> you know, don't you, that being a Christian is not a passive experience. Being a Christian isn't about just turning up. It's not about being here on a Sunday. Most of our Christian life doesn't take place here. The vast majority of it takes place out there, doesn't it? That's where we're supposed to make every effort. You know, on the 23rd of July, in a few weeks' time, we're going to see possibly the start of the greatest show on earth. We might see the Olympics taking place in Tokyo. I love it. I, I hope you do too. I love watching the Olympics. Tracy and I sit there and we love to see those finals, see the athletes competing, people who have trained day in, day out. They've physically got themselves ready. They've mentally got themselves ready. They have focused on the event in which they're taking place. They make every effort. Thank you, Dan. Now, you know in the Bible, the idea of training and physical effort is a theme. Can you say there, Dan? I need it again in a minute. Runs through the New Testament. Paul said this to the church. In, no. <laughs> he, says, he says this to the church in Corinth. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. 
He said this to Timothy. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. To the church in Philippi, he said this. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The Bible talks a lot about making the effort to build like athletes do. But I want to watch, ask you to watch this video again. And Dan, would you pump up the volume a little bit, please? I wanted you to notice the crowd there. That was what was called Super Saturday. Now, Tracy and I and the children were on holiday for a short weekend when that happened. And we were in a hotel. I was in a room with Adam and the dogs, and Tracy was in a room with Hannah next door to us. And we were all watching this, but everybody, I think, in the hotel was in their room watching that. And as Mo Farah came on the last lap, the hotel was as loud as that. Just like that one guy who was shouting, come on, Mo! In the book of Hebrews, we read this. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us... Let you and me run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So Peter, in his prison cell, knowing that he was going to die, thinking about what did he want to pass on to the church, what did he want to tell them that he learnt throughout his Christian life? He said this, make every effort. Because Peter knew that he was running a race and there was a crowd watching him, cheering him on. And of course he knew he was on his last lap nearing that finish line. And he knew that some of the great heroes of faith were saying, come on, Peter, you're nearly at the line. And Peter's saying that to us today. Come on, make every effort. And he does that because he says, if you want to live an effective life, make every effort to attain seven virtues that he lists. He says, make every effort to add to your faith, that's your faith, your salvation, your knowledge of Jesus, make every effort to add to that this, add goodness. Now that word means moral excellence. It means the character that Daniel had when he was being asked to pray to King Darius and he said no. You remember Daniel was then faced with being thrown into the lion's den, but he had goodness. He had moral excellence that knew that the right thing was to obey God. Peter says, make every effort to have that quality in your life. He says, make every effort to add to your life knowledge. And the word means knowing the acts. 
It means knowing the way God works. And the way we find that out is reading the word. He says, make every effort to do that. He says, make every effort to add to that self-control. I was reading this morning that uh, President Lyndon Johnson had a problem with his weight. And his wife said this to him, which apparently he recorded in his diary. You can't run the country if you can't run yourself. And because of that, he actually lost four stone. She said, you can't run the country if you can't run yourself because you need self-control. Peter says, make every effort to add to the, all of your, those other characters and to your faith, add self-control. But he then says, add this virtue as well, add perseverance. That word means cheerful endurance. That's what we spoke about at the Life Group on Thursday when we spoke about the persecuted church. They have cheerful endurance. They don't give up under the hardship they face. They're continuing to serve Jesus. Peter says, add that to your virtues. And he says, add godliness. Godliness, which means God-likeness or holiness. Not a very popular word these days. Peter says, make every effort to add that to your life. And then finally, there are two virtues, he says, to add to your life. One is brotherly love, and the other one is God's unconditional love. You know in the Bible there are four words used to describe love. The, the two we see here, one is filio, which is mean the love that you have for a brother. The love that you have for people in church. He says, grow that virtue. And then he says, grow agape, God's unconditional love in your life. So Peter, in his prison cell, running his last lap, running towards the end of his race, is passing on the wisdom that he's learned from his life that the Holy Spirit is reminding him of. And he says, if you possess those qualities, you will be effective and productive. I don't think there's anything worse than being a Christian and being ineffective and being unproductive. If you're going to be a Christian, go all out for it. Run the race. Who doesn't want that? But Peter makes it very clear that it's a continuing effort that we must all make. He said you must have those qualities in increasing measure. So you don't just get self-control. He said get more of it. You don't just get godliness. Get some more of it. It needs a continuing effort. Because Peter tells us if we build our lives like that, three things result. The first thing is, he says, we make our calling and election sure. You know, don't you, that the Bible makes it clear that we're called by God, that we've been chosen by him, that we've been elected by him, that he knew we were going to be his sons and daughters. And Peter says, if you add those qualities to your life, you're making that calling certain. You're outworking that calling in your life. But he also says this. He says, if you add those qualities to your life, you won't fall. You'll be stable. You'll be firm. You'll be like the psalmist spoke about when he said that you'd be like a tree planted by rivers of water. You'll be rooted firm. But finally, he says, if you add those qualities to your life in increasing measure, you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So we know, don't we, that an effective and a productive life isn't based upon your bank balance. 
Jeff Bezos has not led an effective and productive life just because he's the richest man in the world. If this morning you can say that Jesus is your Lord and Saviour, you've led a more effective and productive life than the person that's got the big bank balance. Peter, in his cell, the fisherman that was transformed to become the pillar of the church and was about to die, who was running the end of his race, left a letter for us, didn't he, where he says, this is what I've learnt. And this morning, we can then say, yes, Father, we want to understand, we want to put that into practice, we want to be effective and productive, just like Peter said, we could be by making every effort. So as the, we come to this season where we're going to have the Olympics on the TV, hopefully we'll be able to jump up and down at somebody in the English team. Maybe you can stop and ponder about, are you living the effective and productive life that Peter did? And he urges us to today as well. Amen.